Thank you. Good morning. First thing we do, give God the glory. Give him a hand, would you please? Thank you, Father. Another day to praise God. Thank you so much for coming early. We're here to get excited and hear more and for God to get our attention. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Father, for this beautiful day. Oh, Father, for this is the day you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad. So much to be glad, Father. So much. We deserve so little, Father, but you are so willing to give everything. And you gave us your son. Thank you, Father God. Father, let this meeting be to your glory. Bless it. Be with our speaker, Malcolm. Work through him, Father. Also, Brother Joe, later. Right now, Father, prepare the hearts and souls, Father. You have the right message for them to deliver. It's going to be to your glory, to your glory. Father, grace us with your power and your forgiveness. In Christ's name, amen. Give it up for the praise team. Give it up.
worship you with all of my heart. I will worship you with all of my mind. I will worship you with all of my strength. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. More love. More power. More and musicians worshiping the Lord. Hallelujah. Good job, guys.
sit down if you can. Amen. God. I know we've done it several times, but we have men that are committed to love the Lord and give so much time to give us great music. One more time, give it up for the praise man, would you please? I know you're ready for a second round for a great message. Little to say about this man, a man of God. Give it up. Malcolm, get up here, brother. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jimmy. What a blessing to be a part of these days. I, I, I'm so thankful for these men playing, ministering to us. I, I was sitting there thinking, if I just walked in and saw them standing around, I'd say, well, they, you know, they, they probably need a jackhammer in their hand or sitting on the seat of a caterpillar tractor. I mean, they just rough, they just burly men. You know what I'm saying? And then they pick up these instruments, and my goodness, what good gospel jam comes out of them. I love it. I really appreciate it because doing what I do, well, I'll put it like this. If you travel with me for a little while and had to get up and preach behind what some of the stuff I have to get up and preach behind, <laughs> they wouldn't even let them pipe it into Huntsville. It'd be considered cruel and unusual punishment and I have to get up and preach behind it. So I'm grateful to God for these men ministering to us, this wonderful God anointed music. Thank the Lord for it. If you have your Bible this morning, follow me to the New Testament book of Philippians chapter three. I believe I have the green light from the Lord to preach on uh, what is hands down my favorite passage in the Bible. I consider it to be the most perfect confession of faith recorded in scripture. Philippians chapter three, and uh, we'll read beginning in verse seven. I'm going to break into a paragraph for, for time's sake, but I'll reference the context momentarily. I told you last night, and, and I say it again, that I'm just a Bible preacher. And I say just because that's, that's all I do. I just, uh, it's what God called me to do. He called me just to open the Bible, read a passage, and explain it the best I can by his help, because the word of God is the power to change lives. Scripture calls itself the seed. We're soil, it's the seed. But apart from the seed falling, no real radical change can take place in my life. So the seed is the word of God and I wanna hear it myself today as I read it to you and receive it afresh. I wanna say thank you to Brother Joe, Brother Tim, Brother Jimmy and others involved in the men's ministry for giving me the privilege of being here. This is my second time to be a part of your men's conference. And, and you know, it's always a blessing for a traveling guy like me to be asked back 
I've been a lot of places one time. And you know, when it was over, they didn't want no more of me. And usually I didn't want no more of them either. Those kind of things are usually mutual, you know. So always it's a blessing to be asked to come back somewhere because now it's all on you. You knew full well what I was when you called me to come. <laughs> Philippians three, let's read beginning in verse seven. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There are many passages in the Bible I could take us to that would basically constitute a rebuke for wrong thinking and wrong living as a professing child of God. But here now before us we have one that celebrates the right way to think, the right way to live, the right way to prioritize. I'm going to speak from this passage on the subject of the confession of a radical Christian. Now I use that word radical, I titled this passage years ago before the book Radical came out. Since then, that book has been around the world and has sold many copies and rightly so. It's a good book written by our brother over in, in Birmingham. It's a tremendous book and I, I'm not against it by any means, but when I read that book, I thought to myself, really what we call radical Christianity today is just biblical Christianity, just normal biblical Christianity. So in essence, what we're going to look at in this text is the confession of just a normal New Testament biblical believer. What does it involve, this New Testament Christianity? Well, I want you to notice four things. I'll give you four adjectives to describe this passage that I've read to you. First of all, this is obviously the statement of a saved man. You saw verse seven with me, let's notice it again. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Now what he's referencing in the seventh verse is what he's just spoken of in the preceding verses. He, he, he looked back in time at who he was before he came to Christ and what his life consisted in. And so he said, now there were, there were some things that at one time I thought they were in the plus column of my life. I would have said that these things would cause me to earn acceptance with God. It was who he was by birth. He was a Hebrew. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was educated in the things of the Old Testament law. In fact, so much so that he was in the group called the Pharisees. He was one of the best of the best, a shining star in the Pharisees' pantheon. Here he was, a man on the, on the rise in the religious world of his day. We would say of him, he was greatly religious and he was highly respected. But there came a day in his life when he had to say, none of this is gonna help me. I'm a man in need of a savior. He said, there was a point in my life when I stopped trusting in my religion and I stopped trusting in my righteousness and I gave up all confidence in my respectability and I had to confess, none of that can help me. I have to have Jesus Christ. Now you remember how that happened for Paul. He was on the Damascus road. He literally ran into the resurrected Christ, heard his voice audibly, was smitten from his horse, blinded physically until he was willing to open his eyes to spiritual truth. You may not have had, probably didn't have as dramatic an experience as Paul did, but the same essential thing has to happen to you for you to be saved has happened to Paul. There has to come a point in your life when you say, I cannot trust myself, who I am, what I've done. It doesn't matter how many hours I've logged in a church or how many times I've gone to Sunday school or how much money I've given to the cause of Christ. None of that can help me. I'm a man in need of a savior. 
I have a friend who pastors in Texas now, but he's from Louisiana, deep south Louisiana. You ever heard of a place called Cut Off, Louisiana? It's down toward Grand Isle, heading out of Homer, Louisiana. You go through some holes in the road. Cut Off, Louisiana is where Bayou Lafouche. If he were preaching here today, you'd almost have to have an interpreter to understand him. <laughs> deep, rich, thick, Cajun accent. I heard him give his testimony one time. He said, I was raised up Catholic. That doesn't shock you if you know that part of the country. He said, I was raised Catholic. And then in my teenage years, I joined an Assembly of God church. And then in my early 20s, I joined a Baptist church. And then one day I got saved. <laughs> and he said, one thing I discovered out of all of that religious background is none of that can help me. Jesus alone can save. Now, I'm saying to you, that's what verse seven is all about. When I ask you this morning, what are you counting on to get you into the presence of God? What are you resting yourself on to earn you a place in God's heaven? If you start saying, well, I'm a pretty good old boy. I pay my bills on time. I treat my family well. If you start thinking about what church you're a member of or how many uh, hours you've attended services, if you start thinking like that, you've missed the boat, ladies. Listen, what I'm saying to you, brethren, I cannot trust anything but Jesus to save me. So here's the confession of a saved man. And I think that's obvious enough to anybody here. But not only is this the statement of a saved man, this is the statement of a seeking man. And here's what verse 10 says. I'm gonna jump ahead in the text. I'm coming back to verse eight and nine in a moment. But here's the thing that grabs me out of this verse and makes it precious to me. Paul says that I may know him. Now you might want to object with Paul and say, now uh, listen, brother, you know him already. I mean, good night of living. By the time you wrote this passage of scripture, you're an old servant of God. You've been preaching the gospel for many a year. You met him, you met Jesus years and years, decades ago, back there on the Damascus road. How can you say that I may know him as if you don't know him? You already know him. And the apostle Paul would say to us, my friend, I've only touched the hem of his garment. There is so much more of Jesus I want to know. See, these words constitute the confession of a man who not only has been converted, he's not only born again, but now as a born again believer, the grand passion of his life is to press into Jesus. As the old song says, pressing on the upward way, new heights gaining every day. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the Bible says we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, simply meaning the longer I'm saved, the more I ought to know Jesus, the deeper my knowledge of him should become. There are a lot of folk today, a lot of church members who have the cockeyed notion that the moment of their conversion is the end of their dealings with the Lord. Once they get saved, once they pray that prayer and make that confession of faith and and identify themselves as born again, that, ah, that's the end of that now. I've, I've got that settled. But of course, the truth is that's the beginning. That's the launching pad for a lifetime of panting after the Lord. Paul said, I forget those things that are behind. I reach toward those things that are before. I press toward the mark. May I tell you this morning, brothers, the, the reason God saved me is not primarily to take me to heaven and keep me out of hell. The reason God saved me is to reconcile me to himself that we might have fellowship. And the whole throb of the heart of the child of God ought to be that we might fellowship with him more perfectly, more deeply as the days of our salvation go by. Paul was certainly a saved man, but he also was a seeking man. There was a longing in his heart to go deeper with Jesus. I spoke of that last night, this longing. This is the thing that God put on my heart for my portion of this men's conference, the cultivation, the intentional, it, the intentional and aggressive cultivation in our hearts of a longing after the Lord, a, deeping, a deepening desire to follow on to know him. I believe this, I believe the one thing that blesses God's heart more than anything else is to find a person who really wants him. Not just what he can do for us, most folk want him to do something for them. And he does great things for us. But what really rejoices the heart of God today is for a man who says, I'm saved, I know I'm saved, but that alone does not satisfy me. I'm seeking him, I want to know him in a better way. 
He is the great pearl of price. He is the great goal of my life. He is the thing I'm seeking hard after. One of my favorite songs is a song I've never heard sung. If you men can learn this before I see you again. If you do, you'll be the first one that's taken the challenge. I've mentioned this all over the country. It's obviously a very difficult song to sing. I'm a weird guy. I look through hymnals and I read lyrics. I read the text of some of those great, the ones that I don't know. I mean, I like to look at them. There's some meat in some of them, really powerful. And one I came on says, my goal is God himself. It's an ancient hymn. My goal is God himself. Not joy, not peace, not even blessing, but himself, my God. Tis his to bring me there, not mine, but his. By any means, O oh Lord, at any cost. My goal, I believe what is killing American religion is the idea that Jesus is a means to an end. It's by means of Jesus that my marriage gets fixed. By means of Jesus that my, my life is saved from hell. By means of Jesus, my finances get blessed. When Jesus is nothing more than a means to an end for me, then just as soon as he doesn't produce like I think he ought to, I'll throw him under the bus, man. I'll jump ship, I'll go somewhere else, I'll follow some other trail. If he's nothing more than a means to an end, then I'm always gonna be in spiritual peril. But when he becomes the end, it doesn't matter what he does or doesn't do. When he is the end, then I can say I want to know him and I want to know him more than anything else in the world and that's the grand passion of my heart. So we have here the confession of a saved man. He counted all things lost. He said, I can't trust anything but Jesus to save me. We have the confession of a seeking man. His heart beats with this longing that I may know him. And then we have here the confession of a surrendered man. Now I'll take you back to verse eight. I want you to notice the tense of the verbs here. The Bible is written very specifically. I believe the word of God is inspired right down to the words that make up the word. And so I want you to notice the tense of the verbs. I'll read verse seven and then verse eight. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. That's a past tense word. That refers back to when he got saved. I counted loss. Verse eight, yea, doubtless, and I count. That's present tense today, right now. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him. Right now today, you see, here is a man, I would say this verse would certainly indicate, and I, bought, I, I put my phone here because I wanted to read this to you from another translation. Verse eight, yes, truly, and I am ready to give up all things for the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, which is more than all, for whom I have undergone the loss of all things, and to me they are less than nothing, so that I may have Christ as my reward. Less than nothing. This is a man who is absorbed in Jesus. You see, Jesus Christ was not one of several priorities in Paul's life. Jesus was the priority in Paul's life. And compared to knowing Jesus and walking closely with him, everything else was garbage. Nothing that the world or the flesh or the devil could offer had any appeal to Paul anymore. Here was a man sold out to knowing Christ above all else and at all costs. He had eyes only for Jesus, I would say. So much so, in fact, that he said the knowledge of Christ is excellent. He called it the, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, which means the word excellency means it was more valuable to him than everything else rolled up together. In fact, he said knowing Jesus, and he means by that, not just an intellectual knowledge that there is a Jesus, but walking with him, intimately fellowshipping with him. He said this intimate fellowship with Jesus is so much more valuable to me than everything else that compared to that, all else is dung. Boy, that's a strong word. In fact, it's hardly polite, to be honest with you. If it wasn't a room full of men, I wouldn't talk about it. Dung. I wrote a message on that word dung, Brother Joe. I wrote a whole message on that word dung. I titled the message, Don't Let the Doo-Doo Deceive You. <laughs> I don't tell everybody that title, but it is my title. I made the mistake of telling one church that title and they put it on their marquee the next week. They sent me a picture of it. I don't recommend you do that necessarily, but they did. 
dung. You know what the devil specializes in? Gift wrapped garbage. He takes junk, nonsense, wraps it up, puts a bow on it, presents it on us. You know, they say about food in the, the high class restaurants, it's all about presentation. I think the devil's bought into that deal. If I can just get the presentation right, these bunch of knuckleheads will swallow anything, he says. And so he brings this gift wrapped silver plattered pile of doo doo to me. Paul says, now you ain't fooling me. I don't care what kind of bow you put on. I know what those blue flies mean circling around. I know what that means. I can smell dung. I know what dung smells like. You're not tricking me. I know what matters and what doesn't. Two men died this week. One man you know by name, Merle Haggard. Everybody knows Merle Haggard. He died this week. Another man died. You don't know his name, Vester Crutchfield. Vester Crutchfield's one of the most Holy Ghost filled Baptist deacons I've ever met in my life. I had the privilege of pastoring him in the last church before I went on the road. He's 91 years old, passed away this week. I've never, known a, I've never known a man more full of God. He went home to be with Jesus this week. Now those two men left this world, one man famous, everybody knows him, the other man unknown to you, you've never heard his name. But my friend, as soon as they breathed their last and stepped off this earth plane, there wasn't but one thing that mattered. And that was how well they knew Jesus Christ. Paul said, I've just got one thing on my agenda. I'm not distracted by a bunch of nonsense. I've got one thing. I am a surrendered man. My whole self is surrendered. I know you can't tell by looking at me or listening to me for sure, but I have a big romantic streak in me. I really can be a romantic guy. And I was traveling with my wife to preach a revival. We were in a revival meeting close enough to our home to drive one day and we were in our car. She was over beside me. We were driving across country and I looked over at her, my little wife, if you knew her, she's so beautiful. She's as beautiful as I am ugly. And that's saying something. When I looked around and saw that you guys were broad putting that on, the, I thought, now look, this ain't right. It's bad enough for people to have to see me in the pulpit, but to do that, that's wrong. That's just wrong to people. My darling little wife, precious, beautiful, a Southern belle. I looked at her and I said, Nancy, I don't want you to know, honey, I, I have eyes only for you. And before I could even take a next, she said, you better have if you want to have eyes. <laughs> She's not big around as my right leg, brother, but she came back with that just like that. Amen. I thought that's good. You know, really, that's, a, that's good. You know what destroys intimacy in marriage? When one of the partners has eyes for somebody else. Yeah. They don't have to actually commit adultery. It's, just, it's enough just to have a roving eye. Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery with her in his heart. It's a mind, it's, a, it's an eye that starts looking after and lusting after other women, other men, if it's the, the female part of the couple. Here they are, eyes for somebody else. Nothing destroys the intimacy of a marriage quicker than that. I wonder if you had a wedding going on here and Brother Joe was called on to perform the ceremony and here they stand in the front and the bride and the groom are there and he asked those questions, do you and will you, forsaking all others, will you commit only to each other till death do you part, to love, to cherish, so forth. Just each other. And the, and the fellow was to say, well, now, Brother Joe, listen, you know, we need to be a little reasonable about this. I mean, here's what I'll do. I will guarantee 362 days a year to this woman. 300, I'm just gonna reserve one weekend a year for someone else. Reckon that work? I mean, that's a pretty good percent. That's certainly a most of the time commitment, right? Well, what you would see is a bouquet of flowers flying one way and you'd hear the ringing sound of a fist on a jaw. If it wasn't the woman popping the guy in the noggin, it'd be Brother Joe popping him upside the head. Some, that guy needs to be hit by somebody <laughs> to be that stupid. Because you know this, it, in marriage intimacy, it's all or nothing. There is no mostly committed. There is no 99% surrender when it comes to the marriage altar. It's all or nothing. And yet a multitude of professing Christians will with a high hand march in and out of church every week saying, I'm mostly surrendered to Jesus. I'm 99, I'm more surrendered than you are. I've only got one or two little things that I know he doesn't really approve of, but hey, I'm mostly, most of me's on the altar. And we wonder why there's no power and glory of God on our lives and on our churches. 
It's not mostly to Jesus. It's all or nothing, brothers. And Paul said, I mean business about this. I am a surrendered man. Christ is my all. And then the final thing I would say, and I'll be through, the, this passage of scripture contains the reality that this is a statement of a serious man. And you can tell this is serious what I'm talking about. In verse 10, you have these words, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And if we could stop right there, we'd all say glory to God because everybody wants power. But he didn't stop with the power of resurrection. He said, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now there are deep waters here that need to be plumbed. I'm not going to do it today on this Saturday morning. I'm going to simply say the most surface level of verse 10 says, here is a man who is dead serious about his walk with God. Whatever else you can learn out of verse 10, and there are many things that many men of God in the past have plumbed out of this 10th verse that are rich and deep and serious truths. But one thing certainly you would say, this man is saying, I want to know Jesus better. I want to be deeper in my walk with him. And I mean it's to such a degree that if it takes suffering for me to experience Christ more personally, then I'm welcoming suffering into my life. We talked yesterday about a friend of ours, Brother Ron Dunn, who's home with the Lord now in private conversation. Brother Joe's office, we were talking about Brother Ron. And uh, Brother Ron Dunn, if not the greatest Bible teacher of our day, one of the greatest for sure. He told a story in a Bible conference that I was in of uh, when he was a college student, a young preacher boy. He was invited to preach a youth revival at a local church, a church that, they, that he could drive to from the campus where he was going to school in Oklahoma. And he, he drove and the, the man who sang for the revival meeting also was a student and they rode together, carpooled. On Sunday morning, Brother Ron drove his car and the singer rode as his passenger. Sunday night, the singer drove and Brother Ron was the passenger. And he said, before they pulled out from the campus to head to the church on the, the singer's turn to drive, he said to the preacher, Brother Ron, let's have a word of prayer before we drive off. And so, they bowed their head and prayed and the singer who was the driver of the car said, Lord, please keep us from being in an accident today unless you could get more glory out of our having a wreck. And when Brother Ron told that story, I thought to myself, that guy probably wouldn't be the captain of the prayer chain in most of the churches I go to. I mean, is, is that the fellow you want to call? When the doctor says it's not a good report I'm giving you. You want somebody saying, now Lord, heal him unless you could get more glory out of him being sick. I think Paul would say amen to that prayer. In fact, I know he would because earlier in the book of Philippians chapter one and verse 20, Paul's in prison, literally facing the possibility of execution as a preacher of the gospel. And he said, this is how I want you to pray for me. Philippians 1:20. He said that as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul said, don't be praying that I live. That's not my concern. Don't be praying that I get out of jail at all costs. That's not my issue. What I want is Christ to be glorified to the maximum, magnified to the maximum in my body, whatever that involves for me. Brother, that's a serious Christian. Now I wanna ask you this morning, my brothers, can you apply these four adjectives to your life today? Can you say, I am a saved man? No question about it, I'm a saved man. Can you say, I am a seeking man? My heart, throbs with a desire to go further, to go deeper with Jesus. Can you say today, I am a surrendered man. As far as I know of myself, my all is on the altar. Jesus is not mostly Lord. He is holy Lord of me. I'm a surrendered man. And can you say, I'm a serious man. I want him so badly that whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'll be willing to do. We used to sing that song up in that church in Paris, Texas, where this man lives that I mentioned earlier, Brother Vester, the church where he was a member, where I pastored 29 years ago. They used to sing this song. I've never really heard it anywhere else, I don't think. It says, whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord. 
That's what I'll be willing to do. I'll trade sunshine for rain. I'll trade comfort for pain. That's what I'll be willing to do for whatever it takes for my will to break. That's what I'll be willing to do. Christ is all, but he must be all to me. Father, in Jesus' name, help us this morning. Weigh ourselves in the balance of the scriptures. We have this terrible tendency to measure ourselves by ourselves and to compare ourselves to ourselves. And so if we look and act and think about like the rest of the Christians around us, we assume we're okay. But the standard of measurement is not each other. The standard of measurement is your word. And as we weigh ourselves in the scales of the word today, as the plumb line of scripture measures us today, God help us to be honest about our, our own heart condition. In Christ's name, amen. No sense sitting there like that. Let's stand up and sing one more song. Amen. Let's do something for Jesus. We can sing about Jesus. We're waiting on you, brother. <laughs> Computers and electronics, aren't they wonderful? Uh, now I'm out of excuses. Go ahead. It's waiting on you now, man. softly spoken word My conscience a reminder of forgiveness that I need Who is this King of glory who offers it to me Who is this King of angels the blessed Prince of Peace Revealing things of heaven And all its mysteries My spirit's ever longing For His grace on which to stand Who is His King of glory Son of God and Son of
Amen. You may be seated. What a great time of fellowship. What great ministry. Brother Malcolm, Brother Neil, the band, and let's go and praise the Lord one more time, would you? Can't tell you how excited I am for what the Lord's been doing, the testimonies I've been hearing, things that God's been doing in your hearts and lives. Uh, there's that great passage where we need to stand on that Paul said, you know, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to all that believe. Amen. Amen. So uh, never be ashamed of, of, of confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'll show you a quick video clip. To start a fire, all you need is a match. A single flame, tiny in size, but capable of igniting something massive. When left uncovered, it spreads quickly, lighting others as it moves. It grows, occupying any space that will give it room to breathe. As the flame gets hotter, the capacity of its effort becomes exponential. This is a fire. An inferno rages unrelentingly tearing forward, engulfing all that will give it life. And in its wake, it leaves a trail of change. A change born of nothing more than a little flame. This is how you start a fire. simple as uh, lighting a match. The only thing that uh, the match that needs to be lit is our hearts and our lives is we'll have the Holy Spirit to deal with our lives and he's the one who lights us and ignites us and sets us on fire. I'm praying that the end result of us walking out of here in just a little while after we've had this last challenge to you and shared some surprises and prizes and all that stuff that most of all you walk out of here with a new fire burning in your heart. My daughter sent me something that a friend of hers posted the other day on Facebook. I really wanted to share it with you. Uh, it was a picture of these, these, guys, these two old guys in, in McDonald's. In fact, it was her, one of her best friends from Believer's Fellowship growing up, who now lives up in the Fort Worth area, said I had my girls and my, my son at the, uh, at the Mickey D's the other morning, and she took a picture of these guys, and she posted, here's what she posted. She said, y'all, this morning during our breakfast at Mickey D's, these two men prayed almost the entire time we ate. She's over there taking her picture while they're praying. <laughs> I could totally hear them pray for all, A-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L, all their family by name, pray for our country, all the sections of the military and government, for different countries, for themselves, thanking God for so much. I made my kids turn around and watch and listen to them. Told my girls, these are the type of men you need to marry one day. Told my boys that this is what real men do. Yes. No matter how old you get, how much they've learned or how much they've done in life, they know that talking to God's the most important thing they could do no matter where they are. And then we talked about how important and special it was to have friends you can pray with and talk about God with. It was a sweet and precious moment this morning. Made me so thankful we're homeschoolers so we can be at Mickey, Mickey D's at 9 a.m. at breakfast. <laughs> she posted that picture. I thought, you know... That's worth a thousand words, is it not? Men not ashamed, men on fire, men who are bold for God. There's a lot of talk about that, but there's not a whole lot of people that are being that. There's a lot of talk in our conferences and in our churches and revivals about being on fire. We use the term a lot, being on fire for Jesus, but too often the fires have faded and burned out and too many people are sitting around talking about what used to be. You know, there's a short passage I want to read you in Exodus 32 today. In Exodus 32, there's this, there's this passage in, in Scripture that uh, where Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law of God and as God's inscribing on the tablets. And meanwhile, down in the camp below, back at the ranch, there's another thing going on. Moses has left Aaron in charge, and they're down in the valley below Mount Sinai. And as they're down there, they're camped out by the tribes, and there's literally probably, they say anywhere from a million to three million people in this encampment. And as they're down there, things get out of control and the Lord is speaking to uh, 
Moses about what's going on. It starts in chapter 32 of Exodus. And he, let me just start with verse eight. It says, uh, the Lord speaking, verse seven, and the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people, like we put it on you, you know, it's your kid. All right. Your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, they are an obstinate people. It goes on down later as Moses is sent down to the camp by God and Moses comes into the camp. Verse 19, it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burned and he threw the tablets from his hand and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. I think he's ticked off. He took the calf which they made and burned it with fire. He ground it to powder, scattered it over the surface water and made Israel drink it. I think he's ticked off. <laughs> we could use some other terminology. Verse 21, and Moses said to Aaron, little brother, what did this people do to you that you have brought them such, brought such great sin upon them? And here's, oh, don't let, don't get, don't be mad. Don't let your anger burn. You know, these people yourself, you know, they're, they're prone to do evil. For they said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us from the land of Egypt, we, we don't know what's become of him. And I said to them, well, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. And they gave it to me. And I just threw it in the fire. How came this calf? Moses saw the people were out of control and Aaron let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies. So Moses in verse 26, 26 stands in the gate of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And the sons of Levi gathered together. We'll look at a little bit more of that in just a moment. But you pretty much understand the story that's going on. The children are out of the promise, not in the promised land, but they're, they're out of the land of, of cursing on their way to the land of blessing. Meanwhile, while they're camped there, they've just come across the Red Sea. They've seen a great revival. They've been rejoicing. Remember before the Red Sea, they're complaining, we're going to die out here. God splits this Red Sea open. They walk across as on dry ground. The enemy pursuing is drowned in the Red Sea and they throw a celebration. If you go back to the early parts of right after the departure, you'll see them celebrating and making an oath and a covenant to God. We'll worship you. There'll be a monument there. We're going to, you're going to be our God forever. We, we believe you. And not too many days after this great revival meeting, this happens. Isn't that the way it, 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 that we are prone to be in our flesh? If we're not consistently and daily in tune with Jesus Christ, I mean, look at your own life. How easy is it just to drift? How easy, if you don't get anchored and stay anchored, how easy it is to just let the, let the current and let the wind blow you any which way and you end up in all sorts of trouble and defeat and despair in your life. And here they are, they're in the camp. Moses is up hearing from God. He's been gone a little while now. So the people decide they, they want a new leader. And they go to Aaron and, you know, they, 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 they approach Aaron to, to be the leader. Why him? Because he's going to do pretty much whatever they want to do. There is such a famine we'll talk about for men of God in this country. So I appreciate Malcolm and the ministries and evangelists he had. Even back when I was in evangelism 20 some odd years ago, I could count probably on both hands the number of what I call Bible preaching evangelists in, in the state of Texas out of hundreds. Just on a couple of handfuls of preachers that I knew were out there genuinely presenting the gospel, genuinely calling people to repentance and to life, and to abundant living in Jesus Christ. Too many people are out there just going through the motions. You add to that, as Malcolm was talking about, how many churches you go into where the pastoral leadership of that church, you know, it's almost when the service is over, you want to leave the service and shake the pastor's hand, say, hi, good, good to meet you, but pardon, sir, what's your, what's your maiden name? You'll get that in a moment. <laughs> you know, it just seemed that there is a lack of courage there's a lack of spiritual fortitude. There's a lack of manliness, true godly manliness. In the church today, we are in a place of basically drought. You say, well, how did these people get in the place of being from one spot as revival to the next spot of desperation? I think if you take this passage apart, there's about three things that happen here. All right. And it's kind of like as a kid, you ever play with the dominoes and you stack them all up? You push domino number one, it hits domino two, three, four, five. There's about three dominoes that when they fall, the rest, of, the rest in line just go right down with it. 
I think if you want to look at what's happened to America, where we are today, it is the same principle as you see in the camp of Israel that's taking place there at that particular time in history. The first thing, if you follow the story, is domino number one, leadership fails. Moses, what did you do? To Aaron, Aaron, what have you done? You would allow these people to get to the place that they've gotten to. Men have suffered, I believe, a, a, a tremendous, uh, for lack of better terminology, I remember hearing someone talk, call it the, the feminization of the American male. You know, we, we've, we've been feminized by the world around us. We've lost our courage. We've lost our, our spiritual testosterone. I, I don't know what's happened. But it starts right here when, when men fail to provide the leadership that God has called men to provide, then everything behind it begins to collapse. Everything else begins to fall. In other words, as a man in my home, as a man in my church, as a man in my community, I am responsible to keep things headed in the right direction. I'm responsible before God to handle and to navigate the course of the storms that lay before us and to always keep pointing true north, truly towards the cross and to keep things focused upon Christ and upon his cross. And when I fail to do that, then I'm failing as a man tremendously. We have to have, we have to come back to the place that we have a revival, that men come back to be spiritual men of spiritual integrity that know how to hear God and know how to see what God's doing. The Bible talks about in the Old Testament, the men of Issachar. It said the men of Issachar understood the times they were in. I think we failed to understand the times that we are in. These gentlemen are really the last days. You say, Brother Joe, I've heard that all my life. When you make that statement, you yourself are a testament to the fact these are the last days. Because men will say in the last days, they've been saying these are the last days for a long time. <laughs> so you yourself become a prophetic fulfillment. But that's just one of many. Look at where we are in the world today. The world is in trouble. Look at where we are in our nation today. Look at what we have. In, in, in leadership, look at where we've headed. Look where we're heading. This is a this is a divided country. This has been this is probably the weakest point that America has stood in since its birth. It all gets back to men not being men. I mean, the the buck stops at the man's table. I believe this with all my heart. And while the world is crumbling around them. We got men more interested in, in having the, the slickest car, the, 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 the finest uh, activity, the greatest hobby, or whatever it might be, the best boat, the biggest house, the nicest gold, hit that midlife crisis, you know, got to go out and button and unbutton your shirt two or three extra times, you know, put on your big gold nugget jewelry, you know, put your big rings on, get your convertible, get your third wife. All those things that go along with that. And think you arrived. You hadn't even gotten near, much less arrived. That's where we are. But what happens when leadership fails? Well, follow the story. What have you done, Aaron? Now, if you look at, the, if you look at what's going on, you know, this really looks like they're in the 21st century. It looks like some rave or some party or some nightclub scene or some after, you know, Grammy Awards party or something like that. Some Oscar big party that's going on or any weekend in America in any back road. Everybody's partying. Everybody's getting drunk. Everybody's getting stoned. You know, each generation thinks that, you know, getting high is, is, is something new, but it goes all the way back to the, to the Old Testament. Men been getting high and drunk and stoned since the beginning of time, trying to run from their problems. And it's, it's, it's not any different. I mean, there's, there's immoralities going on. You see all kinds of, uh, uh, of wickedness taking place, debauchery. I mean, the, the people are having open public and sexual arrangements out. It, it's just a big party here going on. The music's sounding. The people are dancing. Everybody's getting stone drunk. Everybody's making out. Everybody's shacking up. It's the culture of today. And it's, it's popularized by the music, by the movie industry, by the TV industry. If you really want to live, hey, you got to come to the party. Party! And people have no context of what's really going on all around them. You know, he says, you know, why have you done this? In, in, in Proverbs where it says, you know, where there is no vision, the people perish. Literally the word perish there is a word which means naked. When there's no vision, because there's no leadership, the people are exposed. The people are naked. 
I, I think it was one of the past presidents uh, of the Southern Baptist Convention who made the statement. He says, you know, he was speaking at doing his convention address and thousands of people are gathered around. He says, you know, I feel like I'm, a, I'm down at churches or KFC when I go to church on Sunday morning. Because all I see is breasts, legs, and thighs. It's not just out in the world, it's in the church. Bad enough, I have to turn my eyes every time I go around a corner somewhere. Now I got a church turn my eyes. What's happened to us? We need a revival. We don't need to talk about it. We need a revival. We don't need to agree with it. We need revival. We need revival. We need to have revival and we need to experience revival. But it starts with you, sir. Right here at the foot of your feet lies the blame. At the foot of my feet lies the blame. Will we let God do something? Will we allow Jesus to be Lord? Will we make a decision that will impact our life for the rest of our life? Or will we be content to just go through the motions and be church? I jokingly told him the other day, I said, I walked in the mall with my wife and the sign said, ladies' dress is half off. I told my wife, I said, they're more off than that. <laughs> You know, watching one of the popular TV shows, American Idol, the other night, and, you know, one of the girls gets on there and she hardly has anything on. She sings this song, and then 10 minutes later, she's singing a gospel song with her clothes on. But that's, that's the mindset of the world. You can just be one of those. It's not to make a difference. As long as you're a Christian, you know, be spiritual. That was, the, that was the issue that the first century church faced. They had to deal with that issue. There was that group of people who thought, well, you know, the spiritual thing's one thing and your flesh thing's one thing. So, you know, they, and there the two shall meet. You know, it's just what you are in your spirit. You know, you love God. You know, you're okay with God. You understand God. God understands you. But what you are here, that's separate and that's different. That's not different. When you come to a serious commitment to Jesus Christ in your life, it, it impacts every part of your life. It invades your home. It invades your, it invades your family. It invades your marriage. It invades the voting booth. Uh -huh. Everything is affected by my relationship. Everything is affected by your relationship to Jesus Christ. And he's saying, what happened here? Well, you know, the moral standard fails, but the moral standard always fails when domino number one, the leadership standard fails. Then the next thing is, is to go is morality. And that's certainly where we are as a nation. So what's the third domino? Take note, these people are having church. This is church fellowship, this is church worship. They're dancing around this idol. They're worshiping this, this, this profane God. And they like it because he's a God who lets them do what they want to do because he's not even real. And there they are in this worship session. So when leadership fails, morality fails. Morality fails, religion's corrupted. Christianity becomes corrupted. I remember hearing years ago, someone make this statement. He says, man's morality dictates his philosophy. See, what's that mean? That means if I'm not going to be right in my moral life, if I'm going to have that roaming eye like he was talking about ago, if I'm going to be looking at other women and those kind of things like that, then that's going to affect my spiritual life. I remember talking to a young preacher one time and he, I, I, was, I was fascinated. We were on the road together. I said, man, you need to quit looking at women like that. I said, I, I saw you as a brother in the Lord. I'm going to tell you, brother, that's going to get you in trouble. Oh, man. I, no, I said, you're a married man. Oh, you know, just because you're married, you know, it's nothing long looking at the menu, you know. <laughs> nothing long looking in the refrigerator, you know, if you're married. It's as long as you don't, you know, you don't have to eat anything. I said, pretty soon you're going to be eating off that menu. Right. Pretty soon what you see, if you look back at Genesis, will, will corrupt you and you will be pulled in by those things. Nah, it's no big deal. Well, a year later, he's lost his position at the church he's in because of immorality. A good friend of mine that uh, when I got saved, I was real excited and I began to try to communicate with some old friends of mine and I found a guy I'd gone to high school with, a buddy of mine had gotten saved too. And we, we decided I was going to be out in New Mexico in a, in a meeting where he was living. And I, so I looked him up while I was out there because he was living in New Mexico. And we met at this restaurant. And I was excited and I'm telling you about what God's doing and we're talking about the Bible and the word. And, you know, we never talked about those things we lost. Right. I'm excited, you know, and I asked him how things were going and how, how things were working. And I started telling him uh, one of the things I was preaching. He says, well, I, I don't necessarily believe that anymore. You know, and it was about moral issues. I don't necessarily believe that part anymore. I think that I think you got a little too uh, fundamentally stringent there. Now, here's a man, he's married, he's got a young child. 
We're sitting there having lunch and this girl comes in who's not wearing much of anything, jumps up right beside him, gives him a big old kiss on the cheek, says, how you doing? Now, I know this isn't his wife. Now, I looked at him and says, now I know why you changed your opinion. I'm a lot more fun normally to go to lunch with than that. <laughs> and I know why you changed your mind, because your morality is dick. And uh, gentlemen, you mark it down. If you'll be honest with yourself, you'll look and see, yeah, I've let my morality or my immorality dictate my spirituality because I'm not right with God and I'm not where I used to be with God. It was mainly Beasley who used to say, listen, if you're more in love, if you were more in love with Jesus yesterday than you are today, then you're backslidden. And that's a good standard to look at. Was there a time in my life when I truly, honestly was committed to Christ more than I am today? Then I must be backslidden. I'm not going forward. What happened? Leadership failed. Morality fails. Religion's corrupted. Now, what does Moses do? Well, he's obviously, he's not a happy guy. I mean, he walks in, breaks the commandments of God, walks over to the molten calf, knocks it over, makes him grind it into powder, puts it on the drinking water, and makes everybody drink it. Why would he do that? Well, I think part of the, part of the, uh, the idea is that even if this God inhabits you, it's not going to make any difference. But there is a God who inhabits us that is to make a difference. And if he's not making the difference, it's not God's fault. It's on our end. It's like with Aaron. Well, you know, I, I, I didn't let these people, you know, I didn't let these people get this way. Now, sometimes I think, gentlemen, in church and in our Christian walk in life, especially if we've been in church a while and we start getting cold and lethargic and apathetic in our spiritual relationship, we usually come up with, with, with simple excuses, but they're really, they're not reality. They are just that. They are just excuses. We have to come back to that place that we mentioned to not be removed from the simplicity which is found in Christ Jesus. And the simplicity is this. I was lost. I gave my life to Jesus. I was found. I was dead. I gave my life to Jesus. Now I'm alive. I was outside of heaven, locked into this earth, bound for hell. But when I gave my life to Jesus... I have a place now reserved. I'm already in Christ in heaven and I'm on my way to heaven. It's completely different. And I, that night, giving my life to Jesus, the lights came on. That night when I gave my life to Jesus, my heart came alive. That night, I realized all the junk in my life that I needed to get rid of. I didn't have to have a seminar on what, how to date. I knew that night. I didn't have to have a seminar on what's wrong with drinking. I knew. I, I just knew. Now, I could do one or two things. I could go through and say, you know, my morality dictates that I go back to the party life I was at. And you know what? I can do that and I can find me a preacher who'll condone that. There are a million dead churches all around us who'll sit there and not only condone it, they'll go ahead and drink with you. You know I'm telling you the truth. Quit looking at me like that. Yeah. They'll go out and do it with you. They'll just they'll participate. We've got to come back to the place where our morality doesn't dictate my, my spirituality anymore. I let God's word dictate my spirituality. I'm, I'm, I'm a new man. I have a new life. I have new goals. I have new standards. I have a new unction. You know, before coming to Christ, you said, my brother, I can't live that way. I can't act that way. You gave your life to Jesus. I see the change, but that won't work for me. I can't do that. It, I can't. I'm not going to pretend. So I got so sick, I didn't care anymore. I just wanted to get right. I was so desperate, I didn't matter. I just chose, if that's what it means, just getting out there and continually failing, I'll do that. I'm sick of this. The truth of the matter was, I didn't realize that when I did get right with God, I had all the power I needed to be everything he called me to be. Because now that power inhabits my life. It's present in me by the presence of Jesus and his lordship over my life. That enables me to be everything God's called me to be. It gets back to you say, what about this simplicity issue? It's this. That night, I made a decision. It's like Neil said last night, I chose to believe. It was a crisis moment of faith in my life. Will you or will you not turn your life over to God? But that's not the way most people understand it. They said, will you or will you not go to hell or heaven? Well, I don't want to go to hell, so I want to go to heaven, so I'll pray a prayer. But that's not really the call of Scripture. That's erroneous. It's the same call. Moses stands in the gate of the camp and says, hey, it's time to make a decision. 
I remember talking to a preacher one time, well, there's no place in the Bible for invitations. I said, what Bible are you reading? Opens up one. Adam, where are you? Come forward. You know, it closes with one. The Holy Spirit says, come. I mean, and all through scripture, Jesus said, follow me. Take up your net. Come. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. We are called to be disciples. That's followers. Not being informed, but to follow. A lot of people are informed. They're just missing the transform. So Moses stands in the gate of the camp and he says something like this. Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. Boy, I bet you it was silence. Dead silence in that moment. He's standing there for the camps to hear him. Who is on the Lord's side? In Exodus 20, not too many chapters before 32. God had already made a commandment and a very clear word in Exodus 20 when he says, the Lord, your God is a very jealous God. God always likens his relationship, Old Testament or New Testament, to a love relationship. It's always a love relationship. Who are you going to love? Who's going to be the Lord? Who are you going to give your affections to? Who's going to be the first in the situation of your life? And how often in, in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament does a believer who walks away from God, does that straying, how many times is it referred to as an adulterous relationship? In the Old Testament, it says you've gone a whoring after other gods. In the New Testament, he says you spiritual adulterers. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? It doesn't say friendship with the world is, well, God doesn't like that very much. I know, it's, I know you're doing it. Nah, don't you, I don't want you to get, I don't want to, no, I don't want to hurt your feelings. You know, and I, I just want to help you understand a little more that God doesn't like you putting other things first. And I understand we all do it and I do it myself. And, no. He says it's adultery. If you love things more than you love God, you love yourself more than you love God, you love this world more than you love God, you love your life more than you love the life that God's called you to live, then this Bible says, if you are a believer, you're an adulterer. That's hard talk, is it not? It's hard talk to Moses when he said to Aaron, hey, what have you done, little brother? Now, Moses and Aaron in that conversation is similar to the conversation that's going on here. Even though you aren't speaking, I can hear you. I hear the thoughts. You say, how do you know? Because I've had them myself. The little things that come in our mind, the little thoughts that consent, continue to consist there, you know, is that, you know, it's like Aaron. Oh, what do you mean me? This isn't my fault. Why? Because I have an excuse, so I'm not guilty. You know, it's the old thing. There's excuses. You always got two of them. They're both like armpits. You know, they both stink. Always got excuses. Things we got reasons why. But that's all they are. And they really won't stand at the cross. When you look at what Jesus did and all he accomplished for you and the cost, the high cost of his life on the basis of what it took to save you, for you to come up with these little flimsy excuses, pretty pitiful on our part, wouldn't you agree? Moses said, well, you know, I, I, I just tell the people to, to give me their gold and I threw it in the pot. How <laughs> came this calf? Now, that's a pretty good story, isn't it? I don't think Moses bought it. Because what does the scripture say? It says Aaron fashioned it himself. Aaron shaped it. Aaron did just what the people wanted him to do. The last thing you need to do is go to a church where you can have a pastor or a teacher or a preacher or a leadership tell you what you want to hear. Now, I guarantee you we could quadruple the size of our church in three months if we did that. But that's not really a church, is it? Well, it's not my fault. You know, these people, they're just arrogant people. I'm mean, talking to a student on an airplane. She's, well, you know, you, well, you, she, I, I, you know, I know what you're saying, but that just won't work for me because, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Libra. So you're what? I'm a Libra. What are you? So I'm a Christian. Now watch your sign. It's at the cross. <laughs> Do not think for one moment that the fashion of the cosmos out there and how it's sitting and what moon or stars you were born under is going to affect the outcome of your life. It's not going to happen. You are a product of your own decisions. 
You can blame your mother and it may have been a bad deal. You can blame your daddy. It might have been a bad deal. Mine was. But when it comes down to it, I'm going to have to stand before God for Joe Arms and Joe Arms only. What did I do with Jesus? What did I do with the life he blessed me with? What did I do with the things he blessed me with? How did I navigate the course of my life? And what did I do for the glory of God in my life? It was Francis Schaeffer, one of the greatest minds in Christianity over the last century. He said, you know, he said, what we're dealing with here is the issue. And he titled it, he called it false pietism. False pietism is the idea that we can, you know, uh, do anything we want to do, live how we want to live, say what we want to say, act how we want to act, do and, and go where we want to go, you know, but go to church two hours a week, live the other 166 hours for ourselves, and that's just okay because we went to church. But true pietism, true spirituality will affect our lives. And we won't be in the situation, well, you know, I just can't do this. And, I, you know, it's, everybody just has some kind of excuse. And in the 60s, we call it a cop out. I'm going to turn around and just cop out. What's that mean? They made an excuse, bailed out, didn't do what they needed to do, didn't do what they're supposed to do. This is the culture we live in and nobody's responsible anymore. Therefore, just do whatever you want to do, believe whatever you want, think whatever you want because nobody takes any responsibility anymore. If you, if you get in trouble legally and say you murder somebody, you're going to get an attorney and you know what he's going to do? He's going to take you to court and say, oh yeah, he murdered him, but it's not his fault. It's not his fault. You have to understand the way he was brought up. You have to understand the culture that he had to endure. It's the culture's fault. It's the world's fault. It's not his fault. I know he pushed his wife off that bridge. I know he did it. But you can't blame it. When he was just a little child, he wanted to push his oatmeal bowl off the table. And his mother wouldn't let him. You know how many times he wanted to, throughout his childhood, he wanted to throw it. But his mama said, you can't do that. And then one day, in the heat of this moment, standing on that bridge, all that just came out and he pushed her off the bridge. Blame his mama. It was in the 70s. I remember reading this Houston Chronicle. I think I shared this testimony before the church. I read this article. I used to keep it out because in evangelism, I'd share it. It was out of the Houston Chronicle and it was, a, it was one of those recent studies, you know, that the government pays people to do that are just, you know, like, you know, why do rabbits have pink in the ears, that kind of stuff, you know? And so we have to, we get $2 million to go find that out. So this was on uh, violent crimes and violent criminals in the, in the penal system. They went in, they spent millions of dollars and interviewed these prisoners from all over the world, these, 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 uh, these murderers, you know. And they tried to find the common elements and what the common things were. It was, you know, people from every kind of race and background and culture. And I mean, they were just murderers in every class. And what they came up with, why is this disorder? What, what did they come to? Because I don't think they're going to say it's the sin nature. They came down, they said, you know what we've discovered that in certain, violent, most of the violent criminals, there were high levels of zinc and oxide in their hair. So they're violent criminals. Well, let's just buy a big case of Vidal Sassoon. You know, we can wash that crime right out of my hair. <laughs> just, maybe we can just get a pH balance shampoo. But, it, but that's the culture we live in. I mean, Let's get, even, let's get a little closer to home. What's your excuse? I mean, really? Oh, I just can't get over this. Or it's just too big. Or I just can't. Apparently, you haven't read the Bible. Because the Bible says that, well, in the old person, that old person that you used to be, you can't, you really can't, but you don't live by that old man anymore. You have a new nature. You have a new life. And you live from that life. I get up today. I say, I have a little funeral. Joe Arms is dead. Now over here, I say, Joe Arms is alive. That man's the flesh. That man's dead. I can go to the cross and leave him there. And the next 24 hours of my life, I can live for the glory of God by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that lives in me. If that's not true, then we ought to just have a Bible burning right now because the Bible is a book of lies, but the Bible makes it very clear that you are sufficient to meet everything in your life in Christ Jesus. The issue is today, will I live in Christ Jesus? As God stands in the gate of the camp, will I respond to his call? Who's going to come to him? Who's going to believe? Who's going to trust? Who's going to receive? Listen, I love this, this issue when, when Moses gets up, you know, it's almost as you can see Jesus standing there in Luke 9 when he says, you know, who's ever ashamed of me and my words, him shall the son of man be ashamed of. Jesus very clearly laid it out to us. There's just two roads. This is in the red letter edition, by the way. All right. Jesus said, Jesus declared, there are two roads that, which, that slide before us. One leads to destruction and many are on it. 
One is narrow. It leads to life and few are on it. There's only two roads. Now, I know some of you think there's a third road. There's a road to hell, the road to heaven and your road. Some think that somehow the roads are kind of combined here. One's going one way, one's going the other way. But there's that there's that median in the middle. Which you can kind of park on. No, that's that. There's no median. Jesus didn't say there was a median. He just said there's just two clear cut paths. One of them you're not following me on. The other one you're following me on. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the door. I am the way. I'm the shepherd. I'm the chief shepherd. Over and over through scripture, you keep coming back to Jesus as a shepherd leading his sheep, as a leader leading his people on a narrow road to life. And too many Christians, are if they're on the narrow road, they're headed down the wrong direction. They have their own little golden calf religion. Well, yeah, we're the people of God, but we, you know, we have all this other stuff around us. Moses stands in the gate in the camp. So you know, stop and make your mind up. And I would dare say to you today, gentlemen, without any hesitation, it's time to make your mind up. If you're sitting there and say, well, I can still live the way I'm living and, and please God. You cannot. And I would not be much of a man, nor would I be much of a preacher if I were to tell you, you're going to account to God for the way you're living. We're going to be called into account for the kind of father I was. The kind of man I was. The kind of leader I was. The kind of influence I was. I just can't sit there. I went, oh, the judgment seat of Christ is here. It's all for believers. It's not for the lost. That's the great white throne of judgment. The Bema seat is where I give an account to my life. Do you think you're not going to stand there? Do you think you're not going to be there one day and have to look Christ in the eyes and see those wounded hands of his and those wounded feet of his and just say, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I had to get my kids to the ball game on Sunday morning. You know, Little League's important. And later on in life, you see your kids aren't interested in God. They're not interested in church. They're not interested in the things of God. They don't want to go to church. Your heart's breaking for them and you wonder why? Because you showed them that other things are more important in life. I remember hearing the story. I think it was Bill Stafford. He might have told the story. I'm not even sure. It was about a little preacher by the name of Lorenzo Doe. He's a little hunchback preacher. 1800s, 1700s, I'm not even sure. But he went into a town to preach the gospel. He's been over a little guy. And he went to Jacksonburg, Georgia, which was a booming town on the river. It was a big boom town for the days, filled with obviously all the things that come along with that, the liquor, prostitution, the gambling. And he had one message Lorenzo did was, and that's repent and believe. So he stood in the street corners of Jacksonburg and began to preach, repent and believe. The people began to laugh at him. He continued to preach. That didn't work. He continued, he continued to go on. Then they picked up eggs from the, from the vendors that were in the street selling the eggs and they began to pelt him with the eggs. It literally drove him to the edge of town, laughing him out of town. On the edge of town, there was a man by the name of Seaburn Goodall who was a righteous man who took him in, bandaged his wounds, took him home. The next day, Lorenzo Doe went out to preach again. He stood on the bridge and began to preach. This time, they began to pick up stones and pelted him with the stones. And he was standing there bleeding, literally. He says, you know, I came and I preached the gospel to you. The scripture says they don't believe, they won't receive, and you knock the dust off your feet and you go to the next place. He said, may God do to Jacksonburg, Georgia, the same thing that he did to Sodom and Gomorrah if they choose not to repent. He went back to the home of Seaburn Goodall. They all laughed. They all looked at the preacher, calling down judgment. But at the same time, the clouds did begin to gather that day. An electrical storm broke out, radically destroying buildings and homes with electric strikes. The city began to be flooded from all the rain that was coming down. The people weren't laughing anymore. In fact, History teaches us, if you went back to that particular time in history, the only home left standing in all of Jacksonburg, Georgia, was the home of Seaburn Goodall. Folks, there's a storm coming. The clouds are all around us. The rumblings are taking place. The, the world is on the edge of a violent war like no other time. Jesus declared himself in the end times there shall be wars and there shall be rumors of wars. What's happening in the Middle East 
is not an accident. It's not the result of bad decisions from American governments and anything else. It's ultimately a result of God's prophetic word where Israel will stand defenseless against the nations of the world as they gather around him. We're seeing that happen every day. Ever since 1948, prophecy has been fulfilled at an exponential rate. There's only one thing left to happen before the, before the Lord Jesus begins the whole movement of the tribulation. Seven years of hell on earth. You read that for yourself in the book of Revelation, what that's described as. The next thing, a tick on the tock of the clock is the taking away of God's people off the planet. That in an instant, we're out of here. In an instant, we're gone. In an instant, you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. You will. You come to church one Sunday morning and Brother Tim and Brother Joe and so many others aren't here, you're gonna wonder what happened and why you're here at church all by yourself. What happened? Aliens. Well, what else are they gonna say? And they're right. We're, we've been alienated from God forever. <laughs> He's alien to the world. We were alien to him. Now we're the aliens in this world, just passing through. They don't know. They don't get it. There'll be some. Listen, I tell you that you watch what's happening with Russia. You watch what's happening in the Middle East. You watch what's happening in the, in the, in the different quarters of Europe and the Eastern Europe, especially where Russia's beginning to take a foothold back on the old, the old Eastern states. All that's in place and all that's moving and all that's happening. And the world doesn't know how to deal with it. Yeah. ISIS, Daesh is on the move, on the rise. Yeah. Terrorism on every hand and the world doesn't know how to, what's going on? The end of times is going on. Yeah. God tells us in the end of times, it'll go back to like it was in the early part of times. It'll be those two brothers again. It'll all come back to that with Israel and Esau. These are dangerous times, men. And it's time to pull our heads out of the sand and see what's really going on. Amen. We're all too worried about how the price of gas and what's going to happen next and what's going to happen to the oil economy and what's going to happen to Wall Street and what's going to happen to... You better wake up. Say, God, what do you have me to do? What happens? Leadership fails. Where's the leadership rest? With me, with you. Leadership fails, what happens? Morality fails. What happens when morality fails? The whole religious system becomes corrupted. What has to happen? Moses had it right. He gave an invitation. He gave an invitation. Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. He gave an invitation. What happened? People by the thousands begin to come forward. But not everybody. Tens of thousands didn't. And Moses said, all right, execute the judgment. Now that's in the hands of God as it was then. But they, you know, I'm sure when they went to do that, there were some, oh, hold on, sing one more verse of just as I am, I'm coming. Wow. <laughs> I'll be on the next, one more verse, all I need, I'm coming right now, it's too late. Yeah. There's gonna be a day when it's gonna be too late for you. Yeah. The Bible says it very clearly in Thessalonians, it talks about the strong delusion. It says those who've understood the gospel and have not received the gospel, it says they will receive a strong delusion because they chose to live in their wayward sin because they rejected God and they'll go into the tribulation still lost, still unbelieving, even though they had all the information up here and never got to where it could be received. Yeah. What a tragedy, what a loss. Yes. I remember in revivals one time in a, in a crusade, we were at a service and it was here in spring, as a matter of fact. It was a church in spring. And I gave the invitation one night and I asked a question, how many of you men need to give, how many, to the general congress, how many people want to give your heart to Jesus? They had their heads bowed and many people raised their hand. And I remember seeing a man about third, fourth row back raise his hand and his little boy was with him, probably nine or 10 years old, looked up and he had his hand up too and he saw his dad raise his hand. And the kid's face just lit up. Just lit up. So I want to lead you in a word of prayer and I led him in a prayer and they prayed to him and I said, if you prayed that prayer and you're meant bishops of God, it's one of those Moses moments, let him come forward. People started coming forward. Many people gave life to you, but that man never budged. And the whole time he's standing there holding on with his eyes closed, his little boy was watching him. That's probably one of the most heartbreaking invitations I've ever sent through in my life. To watch that little boy. Just watching his dad. Leadership failed. Leadership failed. I want to encourage you men to ignite 
to get on fire. We're the difference makers in the culture. We're not to settle in for the mediocrity. We're to be the change agents in this world. And if we get our hearts right with God, we can be that. It starts today. Don't say, well, I got to take care of some stuff. No, you can't even take care of stuff without Jesus. Well, I got stuff I got to, no, you can't do nothing without Jesus. I want to trust, believe, and ask God to change our hearts today in such a way that when we do leave this place on Saturday, it's a supernatural change that's taking place in our hearts. But it starts with our belief. It starts with what Moses said, who's on the Lord's side, let him come to me. There's some of you here, you've known the Lord a long time, but you've seen the, the deadness creep in. That's not spiritual maturity, by the way. That's deadness. All right? It's just deadness. There's only one way to deal with it. So, Lord God, I'm just dead. I need a light of fire. I need, you to, I need to fan the flames. I, whatever, you know, you to breathe on me with your oxygen so the fire can, can ignite. I need a fire in my life. I, I need fire in my belly again. I, I, I need you to move in my heart. That longing is such a clear word to us today. God, stir up that thirst within us even. What we can't even do in making that, God, do it in us. Create a desperation of heart and soul and mind that we, we're hungry. If you're here and you don't know Christ, it's not sufficient to know about Christ. You've got to know Christ. It's just not going to work if you don't know him. He says, on that last day, many will stand before me and he'll say, I, I don't know you. And they'll say, well, Lord, we, did, we went to church. We did all these things. We really, no, I don't know you. Depart from me. You worker of iniquity. Well, that's hard, is it not? Hey, let me tell you what hard is. Dying on a cross is hard. Amen. Suffering the assault of sinners, that's hard. God did all that for you, but he didn't do all that for you. You could just say, oh, I'm a Christian. I prayed prayer. I go to church occasionally. It's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not Christianity. Jesus said, follow me. If you can look in your life and you say, that's not the path I'm walking on right now, I want to encourage you today to respond because we're going to give an invitation and respond to that invitation and say, I, I need to get things right with God. I need to give my heart to Jesus or I need to get my heart right with Jesus. It's one or the other. If you're sitting in the middle, well, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. Well, then go back just with me for a moment. Was there ever been a time in your life when you repented of your sin, gave your life to Jesus? Well, no. Well, here's the perfect time. Amen. We solve that issue real quick. Amen. There's never been a time when you, when you gave Christ your heart and life, started following him, and you got to, you, that's a good question to ask. I'm not sure if I know. I, I tell you how many people I deal with in the church many times. They're always struggling, always struggling, always struggling many times because they just never will get to the point of giving their heart to Jesus. It's a hard way to live your life. And a lot of times they say, why not? <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know, what, what would people think of me? Let me give you a little hint. They don't think about you anyway. <laughs> they don't. They're too busy thinking about themselves. You know what they're thinking? What would people think about me? <laughs> they, don't, they don't think about you. What matters is what you're going to do with what God, what God thinks about you. Would you stand with me with your heads bowed? I'd ask you to take your own personal inventory. I mean, there's been such a clear line drawn these three days we've been together, in or out. I mean, I think there's, if you've been here for most of these sessions, you, you clearly see that. And I would probably say that in the omnipotence and the omniscience of God, that he's already been working in your heart and life, all of us. It's just, are we listening? But I'm gonna ask just to, to just draw a circle around your own self tonight, this morning. And just, just in this moment, don't think about anything else. Don't look to anybody else. Don't worry about anybody else. Just look at your own heart. If you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? The only way it's ever going to be heaven is you can say, you know, I know it'd be heaven because there was a time, and I can go back to that time in my life when I made a real commitment to Christ. I know it's real. If that hadn't happened, then what better moment than right now? A better time than right now. As Christians, what about you, sir? Where are you in your walk? Where are you in your life? With our heads bowed, I, I want to ask you to acknowledge something. How many would just acknowledge this? Uh, Brother Joe, I, I know that I'm a Christian. There's no doubt in my mind that if I died right now, I'd spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. And you say, that's me. I know that I know. I know. Would you just slip your hand up for a moment? I know that I just raise it up as a testimony. If you're not sure, don't raise it. Just to raise it. Just don't, don't raise it. You can put them down. All right, you can place them down. How many of you that just raise your hand could say, Pastor Joe, as much as I know I'm a believer, I know my heart's not right. 
I know it's not right. And there are things in my life that are dishonoring and displeasing to God. And I want to get them right. Let me just slip your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. Just slip it way up high. That's me, Pastor. All right, if you raised your hand just then, look right at me. What would hinder you right now? I'm responding to the call that goes back to Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And come. Between you and your high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, just find a place to pray somewhere up here. All right? Just come right now. And just between you and your heavenly Father. Between you and Jesus. The Bible says we confess our sins. God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'd encourage you right now just to get it right with the Lord. Be specific with him. Lord, this, has been in my, this is in my life. This, it's been pornography. It's been lying. It's been cheating. It's been stealing. I've been, been an honorable man. Whatever it is. Just whatever it is. Be honest with God. He stands ready to do something you like. With our heads still bowed though, there's some of you here who couldn't honestly raise your hand that you know that you know Christ Jesus is your Lord and Savior. The same call comes out today to slip out now and come to one of these men that are standing here right now. Just come and say, listen, I want to pray with somebody. I want to give my life to Christ today. Let them just pray with you. Let them just, just agree with, with your commitment. The Bible says we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth. There's that call. Not only to say, I believe it in my head and my heart. Now I, I need to say it. I need to tell somebody. I need to confess it because it's not just today. It'll become the confession of your life. Why don't you come right now and say, Pastor, I couldn't raise my hand that I really know that I know Jesus because I'm not sure or I know I don't. Would you step out right now while others are praying? Come to one of these men right now. Don't, don't hesitate, gentlemen. Don't let Satan talk you out of this. Don't let him beat you up. You make your decision. While the, while the iron is hot is when we strike. While the Holy Spirit is speaking, while conviction is present. Don't worry about what anybody thinks or says or does. Come, come while we're praying. Settle this issue. Don't walk out of here with doubts and fears and confusion. You don't need to. Come. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Why don't you still come, gentlemen? Still time for you to respond to the Holy Spirit. With all creation, pray with someone. Come pray with somebody to the altar by yourself. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. And I will adore you. We're clothed in rainbows of living color. Flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. God is still moving in this place, gentlemen. You come. It's not too late. God's still moving. God's still working. Hearts are broken. It's a time to come. Allow the hardness to take over. Come on, resolve. 
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water, such a marvelous mystery. sing the chorus together. Holy, holy, holy Lift is the voice. Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Yeah. With all creation I sing praise, praise to, to King of the King of Kings. You are my everything. You are my everything. bowed just for a moment. God's still moving in this place and God's still working in men's hearts. If there's something you need to say to him, do it now. Just say it to him now. Lord, here it is. Here's my life. Here's my heart. I don't need to run anymore. I don't need to pretend anymore. I don't need to put on a show like I'm spiritual when I'm not anymore. I want to be what you want me to be. Just genuine, real deal. Here's my heart. Wash it. Cleanse it. Revive it. Make it fresh and new. God stands here in this room. There's so much of God available here. It's just mind-blowing. you got to take it, receive it, believe it, stand on it. What, a, what an opportunity. Don't miss it. Precious Jesus. Father, I pray, Lord, for these men, for myself, for each of us here. That what you're saying to us will not be lost in the buzz of the culture around us. But God, we will, as scripture says, we'll not let them slip. We'll hold fast to the truth you've spoken to us this weekend. We'll embrace the cross of your son, Jesus. We abandon ourselves to you. I pray for boldness grace for courage grace for husbands grace for fathers and grandfathers in this room. be able to make the difference in the lives of their family you've called them to make you are worthy you're holy we will honor you we worship you precious Jesus Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, praise to the King. Praise to the King of you are my everything. You are my everything. And I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's worship Him. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything. Wait a moment longer. I'm not going to grieve the Holy Spirit. I, God's still speaking. We'll wait a moment. Precious Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's coming a day, gentlemen. We're all going to stand together around the throne of God. You know, let me tell you something. I believe this with all my heart. I mean, I really do. I, you know, I told folks at a funeral today, said, I'm, in, I'm invested. <laughs> I'm invested here. I put it all on the line. I, I'm not perfect. I have my failings as much as you do. But I'm, I believe this with all my heart. This isn't a pipe dream for me. This isn't something to, to ease my conscience. I really do believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. And I do believe he's coming back, riding on a white horse. His vesture dipped in blood and out of his mouth is going to come a two-edged sword and destroy the Antichrist and all the host of hell. The blood's going to rise to the bridal reins and we're going to come out of that war victorious, triumphant with Jesus Christ. And all the nations will gather around him. All the kings of the earth for a thousand years will come and visit Jerusalem where Jesus will be seated on the throne of David. All of us men who love Jesus will be here on the planet during that thousand years. Doing whatever the Lord tells us to. I just take a maintenance job if you let me have one. Amen. <laughs> whatever we can do. But nobody's going to question, is Jesus risen from the dead? Amen. Or is Jesus the Son of God? It's going to be a settled issue. Amen. Uh, I'm excited. We got a lot to look forward to. Listen, don't let the things of this present life, which are so temporary and so temporal and so passing, hopefully, and rob you of the great things that are ahead of you. Good days. Somebody praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Whatever the Lord said to you, walk in it, believe it, receive it. Some of you may need to go home and tell your wife. I've let leadership fail around here. I want my pants back. There you go. Amen. I'm serious. I need to get, I, I need to take, I need to take the charge again under the Lord's charge. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for failing you. And I'm going to get this right. I'm sorry for even thinking about divorce. I apologize. I didn't, that's not the way he entered in this deal. It's not the way I'm going to close it out. I said, tell death do his part. Tell your kids, I'm sorry. I hadn't been the kind of dad. I've, I've really been, really been slipping here this last while. It hadn't been the testimony of you that I need to be. You may need to make some talks like that, gentlemen. Yes. Amen. Yes. You may need to do it with the other brothers. You may say, you know, I put on a real good show. I've spent a lot of energy trying to pretend I'm spiritual. I'm going to put that much energy into just being spiritual. <laughs> it's a lot less work. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But I love you. I praise God for all that God's done here this weekend. We have a few things we want to do to wrap things up. We have some drawings and things to give away. But let me just leave you with one word. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Jesus is Lord. It's amazing. Ignite. What have we done here for? To believe, am I correct? I want you to look at the word ignite for a moment.
What does it stand for? When you leave here, follow me. I, look at the word. I'm going and I'm telling everyone that Jesus is Lord. Repeat after me. I'm going and I'm telling everyone that Jesus is Lord. I don't think you believe that. I'll give you one more chance. I'm going and I'm telling everyone Jesus is Lord. Give it up for Jesus, please. May I ask you a question? Do you believe that? Do me a favor. Take out your cell phone. Come on. Whatever phone you got. You got your phone out? Go to the tech. You're going to send a text. In your text, to who? I want you to think about your wife, sister, brother, or a friend. You know their number. Log it in. You might have it on speed dial or whatever. Some of you are not punching numbers. Are you ready to have it ready? you have it ready? Okay, you may want to put two or three friends, sister, uncle, somebody you know that's not in this room. You got it? Give me a yes. Okay. On the subject line, I want you to type, I believe. That's all I want you to type. I believe. You got it? Okay, everybody together, when I say one, two, three, you're going to send. One, two, three, send. Okay. Now, you may get a response here in 10 seconds or an hour. Do not respond while you're in this building. They're going to ask you, what did you just send me? I believe in what? I guess you're going to have to, you're going to have to share something. Am I correct? I wonder what you're going to say. Amen? Amen. Give it up. Come on, give it up to the Lord, would you please? Thank you, Jimmy, I, everybody's had an opportunity to thank everybody, but... Jimmy has put in tons of hours. He may have got a lot of emails and texts from me because he was constantly working, serving. I know we had a committee that he recognized, but there was a lot of hours. I even thanked his wife to thank you for allowing us to take Jimmy away from you because he put in a ton of hours, did a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of meetings, a lot of effort. We give God the glory. The committee gets credit, but I want to thank one person in particular that did so much work that I couldn't be prouder of for how it turned out, and that's Jimmy Cabrera. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for Jimmy. He is he just is a blessing. Amen. Love you, brother. Because when these things come together, they do take a lot of effort. And I thank you, Jimmy, for all that you did. Praise the Lord. God just blessed us, didn't he? I don't think any one person will leave and say, I'm not glad that I came and uh, to come again. We also have a men's retreat. That's coming up uh, March 23rd of 2017. So if you want to know what Believers Fellowship and you want to do this again in another format, you can put it down on your calendar right now, March 23 through 25 of 17. It's already a done deal. So mark it down because uh, you guys probably got your emails. You're probably getting a, a flyer uh, emailed to you. But we love God. We love meeting like this. And you can see what kind of things happen. And you may be thinking, boy, I wish I'd have brought somebody else to this. Be planning on who you're going to bring to the Believer's Fellowship Men's Retreat. 
that we're going to have because we love meeting and seeing. No, not here. It'll be at Trinity Pines. But we'll be getting the information to you. So praise God for all that he did. And I hate to, every good thing must come to a close. Amen. It just it's got gooder and gooder and gooder, but we've got to bring it to a close. So let's have a word of prayer as we dismiss. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you.